welcome everyone as you're coming on in. I know this is a huge topic. Uh, we had a lot of people sign up, so we are so excited about uh, our chat today on ATV students and enrolling them. And welcome, Darlene. Oh, I'm so excited to be here, Jen. You know, I'm a, a proponent of serving students who want to further their education but don't have a high school diploma. So thank you for yeah. allowing me to have this chat today. So glad that you're on. I met Darlene, was it at FAPS? Maybe? Oh, yes, FAPS. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was the first time I met you. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was several, it was, it was a few years ago. I believe it was FAPS, but you had a class and I sat in it. That was the mm -hmm. first time I had ever even met you or heard about this topic. And mm -hmm. I was so excited. Cause I just, I, it was things I hadn't heard in years, right. About mm -hmm. ATV student. I learned so much and we just formed a friendship and now I've seen you all over the conference circuit. So I'm super yeah. excited to chat about this with the beauty school community because I know that yes. um, this has become a really big enrollment sector for the career space outside of beauty schools. I still don't know a lot of beauty schools today enrolling ATV students. So I'm really excited that, you know, we had so many people interested in this topic. So let's jump in. So for starters, because our community we don't know who you are, Darlene. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Well, I've been uh, in our sector for 33 years, um, and I've held multiple positions. So it's it's nice to speak to this group as a former school owner. Um, and also, I'm very involved in accreditation. Um, I volunteer my time as a team chair for uh, a couple of accrediting agencies, but also I've served as a chief compliance officer for a large group of schools, uh, chief academic officer, and um, in earlier in my career as a VP of operations, so I've, I feel like I've got a good balance um, of the operational piece, the academic piece, which has to do with delivering our product, um, but also the compliance piece. And especially now in, in our sector, we're under a bright spotlight. So it's even more imperative that we focus on compliance. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because I know that, of course, is a huge question in everyone's mind was, as we're talking about this, how compliant is it? Where can we get into trouble? We're going to talk about all that stuff. We're going to be chatting specifically about enrolling ATB, the right way to do it what the rules were before. And just a reminder, our chat is always on here at Beauty Schools Marketing Group. So you can join the chat and um, you can give compliments or questions. Those are the two things I always ask for. So feel free to jump in there. If you guys have questions for Darlene, we're going to get to it. This is not a webinar where I'm going to be um, sharing my own expertise because I don't have any. And that's why I'm so excited to have you today, Darlene. This is just something I don't know a ton about. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm gonna be asking you questions from me as a learner as well. And then of course, I'll be asking you questions from the chat. But let's go ahead and jump in to the history of ATV students. Cause I remember a time when that was just a phrase, you know, that everyone said, what were the yeah. rules before? Like, was there a specific date when that changed? Share us the history of ATV. You know, you're exactly right. In fact, I for two years, back in 2014, the department at the beginning of, of an academic year, it was July 1st, um, we could no longer serve ability to benefit students. And what ability to benefit means is students who don't have a high school diploma, but that are allowed access to Title IV funds to seek or advance their education. So for two years between 2012 and 2014, um, we could not serve those students until uh, they introduced the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act. And then we could serve the students. Again, it started at the beginning of, a, of a, uh, an academic year on July 1st, but they added a, a, a different piece to it. Before, when we served students as ability to benefit, they had to take a U.S. Department of Education approved entrance exam. So we all know now we have to look at the Department of Education's regs to see which entrance exams are approved. Um, and that was all a school had to do. 
and serve, of course, serve the students and, and, and uh, ensure uh, good outcomes. But when they amended the Consolida Consolidated Appropriations Act, they added another part to it. It's called Eligible Career Pathways Program, or ECPP. And what it means is, is along with the vocational program or the post-secondary program, we offer students the ability to obtain their adult high school um, certificate or diploma. So that's what it means now is the two go hand in hand. ATB, which means ability to benefit, means they have to take an entrance exam to show that they are, uh, we have a reasonable expectation they can complete the program or they have the potential to complete the program. And then concurrently, they seek uh, to obtain their high school diploma. Okay, so before 2012, what was that process? Someone would come into an admissions office and say, I never graduated high school. I don't have my GED. What would the admissions advisor then, what, what were the options for them before 2012? Well, um, they had to take an ATB test. And back then, one of the more popular tests was the Wonderlich ATB. So a lot of schools, schools use Wonderlich SLE right now, but they yep. used the Wonderlich ATB test back then prior to. So that was all they had to do. They drew funds the same way, but they had to validate that the student was capable of completing the program through an ability to benefit test. And that okay, was so that's all it test. was. It was just one test that they would take, yes. and then mm -hmm. they were able to enroll in the school and apply for right. for Title IV funds. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then in 2012, it just completely like came to a halt. It did. It did for two years. For two you years. You know, we have almost 30 million, 30 million people in the country, and we have a total population of 350 million, so what's that, 8.7%, that don't have a high school diploma. So we have an incredible population or sector of the population that needs the skills we have to offer. And this is their path to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is around the time I entered, I entered this industry around 2011, and of course, I, I constantly heard about ATB. And then all of a sudden, I kind of heard about like, oh my goodness, we can't enroll them anymore. Now what? Ooh, and yeah. so as soon as that happened, obviously schools push, go get your GED, go get your GED. And I know that in the admissions mm -hmm. office, that is always the rhetoric, right? We know this mm -hmm. where the centers are. We give them collateral. We say, go down the sure. street, call them, you know, have you finished it yet? Have you finished it yet? Um, and I just don't know a ton of schools that have that that at least are aware that the rules changed, like you said in 2014, where there is another yeah. option. So let's explore that a little bit. Let's sure. talk about you called it. Say it again. Career pathway eligible right. eligible career pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's chat about the rules and how schools can can enroll ATB students today under those new guidelines? Sure. So it really hasn't changed from pre-2012, except they have to be concurrently enrolled in an adult high school program. So let's say I came to your school and you offered a cosmetology program. And I said, I, you know, I'd really like to enroll, but I don't have a high school diploma the admissions rep would say, well, we have a path to that. You would need to take an ability to benefit test. And by the way, now Wonderlick doesn't offer the ATP anymore. So the schools would use Accuplacer and it's reading, writing, and math. And Accuplacer has a great uh, warm-up exercise that they utilize. I'm shocked at the pass rate. Um, because we didn't have math in Wonderlick before. But the student would take the test. It's online. They, they take it online. Okay. If they pass it, then they're enrolled. And the student has to go through the typical admissions process, you know, where we tour them, we describe the catalog. Again, we have to have a reasonable expectation, as we do with any Title IV student, mm -hmm. that they can complete the program. But once they pass that, we enroll them, we draw funds the same way we draw funds with the standard population 
except there's a few added rules. Um, they've got they've got to also be enrolled in adult high school program. And there's several online adult high school programs out there that serve our sector. Okay, so let me I just work... let's just pause there just for one second. So before <laughs> it was just a test you took. Today right. it's a test plus an additional program. Correct. Okay, got it. Correct. All right, go ahead. Let's chat about those programs. So let's say I start school today. I took the test. I enrolled. Today I would start my cosmetology program. I would also start today with my online adult high school program. Okay. Hopefully I would be able to present to you a transcript because I, I went to high school for two years. So I want that transfer of credit over so that I could finish my high school sooner. Mm -hmm. So I would begin today my cosmetology program and my adult high school program. I'd be given a login by the adult high school provider. And I would go through my classes, whether they're English, math, other kind of skills or vocational pieces. Um, I do it all online at my own pace. Are you able to start that program before you actually start cosmetology school? You know, Jen, I love that you say it. I work with several school groups. In fact, I help them roll this program out. And you find little things that you can tweak is to best have the opportunity for the student to succeed. And one is having them start before. Right. Um, you know, if you think about it, some students haven't been to high school in a while. And for them to take two programs at once is a little scary. So... I like when a student starts prior to them starting their vocational program because they acclimate, they build a little confidence, and the chances are greater they'll graduate from both the vocational program and the high school program. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what does it take, other than passing that test, to be eligible okay. for these online adult high school programs? Is there an age limit? Can you only be out of school so long? How does that work? Well, it, it's dependent upon the state, which usually state the guidelines are 17 years old. There's a few states, 18, but it's usually 17. Um, a school would have to partner with an adult high school program. Like I said, I've worked with several. Um, there's C4L. Um, there's, a, a you know, several others that, that you'll see or read about. I've always liked C4L because they're very generous, but they're generous in serving the students and generous to the school. Well, they let's chat about the C4L program then, just just for, for the sake of it. Is sure. what does that look like when, when someone logs in? How long is it? Are there like are, are there a ton of modules? Can they retake tests? Like, can you are are you able to share anything about that uh, program itself? You know, I can a little. Um, I'm not the product expert. I've seen it. I know about sure. it. I sat on their board for a short period of time, so I am familiar. Um, but yeah, again, the student at their own pace. So if they've transferred any credits, let's say I have to take an English and a math or an American history, it's all interactive, just like we see online courses or programs now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's built by a real experienced group out of California who've worked in the LA district. So it follows all California uh, uh, credit guidelines, but it's like any other adult high school program. It's if I'm at a bricks and mortar institution or I'm online. So yes, I can take a test. I can retake a test. I can take a quiz or retake a quiz. There's online support. So the student isn't alone in this journey. They have multiple features or resources to assist the student to complete. Okay, fantastic. And then mm -hmm. on average, we're looking at, I, I'm sure it's different for everyone, right? We have those people that are like, I'm going to finish this in two months, or I don't even know if that's possible, or some people that take, yes. take a whole year. What, what, is, what does that look like as far as completion goes? You know, Jen, I've seen the whole gamut. Okay. Believe it or not, there's a, a there's a group of schools out in the California, Alaska area. They had a student finish in two weeks. And oh, she, okay. had to, she had to get all 21 credits because that's the number of credits that C4L follows for 21 uh, for California. 
but she put her nose to the grindstone and worked straight and finished it. Mm -hmm. So that's possible. I've seen students finish their vocational program without finishing their high school program, which you could do. Initially, when the department allowed us to serve this population again, they said they had to be concurrently enrolled throughout. So if they were in, I'm going to use cosmetology again, and their high school program, they had to be enrolled and participating in both at the same time. No more. So the student is eligible for Title IV funds, whether they finish their high school program or not. Um, now, you want them to finish their high school program because if you had an oversight visit, whether it's a state or an accreditor or the Department of Education, you want to show that you're able to serve that population. So it bodes be better for the school if you show a high retention rate for high school completion and, of course, your program. So typically, you would want to track the outcomes of your ATB, ECPP students, and your general population. Okay, so they technically can finish their cosmetology program before this program, but that's kind of where it might be in the judgment of the school to say, hey, you, you need to complete this prior to graduation yes. before we release your transcripts or diploma or just whatever that is. Okay, that yes. makes sense. Um, regardless though, that entire time, that entire year they're in school, they can still get financial aid. Do yes. you be sending things along the way, like that they have completed this much of the program to get that financial aid, or does that, just all that happen um, at the beginning? You don't send anything to the department if that's what you're referencing. In fact, right. the department doesn't even have to approve this. And that's a common question I get. Do we have to submit something to the department um, to seek approval before we serve this population, and you don't. Um, you just have to be prepared if you have a program review okay. or a reaccred visit that uh, you track the outcomes and you track all documentation for these students. Okay. So as of now, someone did ask that have, actually. What document? Yeah, really? What documentation must the school maintain on the student to show compliance to accreditors and the yes. Department of Ed auditors? Yeah. I love it. I come from the world of compliance. So there's seven areas. And again, if anybody wanted to roll this out, you know, I, I'm i a proponent of this and I serve our sector to be able to serve these students. So I'm happy to help. I've, I've built out policies and procedures that have been vetted through uh, one of the premier attorneys in our sector. So I feel really confident with it. But again, my service is here, no charge. I'm here to help serve these students. But there's seven areas. So once a student enrolls, they take their ATB test, they enroll in your program, and they enroll and in adult ATB high school test, program. by the way, someone asked in the chat, is it, did you say CELSA? Accuplacer. Or, okay. Accuplacer. And Jen, you know, it's less than $10. So the cost Accu to the okay. school is less than 10 bucks. Accuplacer has been around for years. They're, uh, they're guided by the college board, which serves state colleges for years. So okay. any of this information, your, your viewership or your, anyone participating here, I have all the information I can send to you and you can send to them. So again, anyway, okay, so I can someone did them. ask about CELSA, CELSA ATB test. Have you ever heard of that? Do you know if that's accepted? I have. And I, I think it is still, is that the California test? We'll see. If I she would have to, yeah. Okay. I'd have to look again. Okay. I can send you the list from the okay. Department of Ed regs that list each uh, entrance exam that's approved by the department. Yes, she did say California. So you're right about that. Um, okay. Okay. I awesome. Think it's okay, over. okay yeah. perfect. And so, go, yeah, go back to those seven things you were talking about. Sure. So the seven things are things that we typically do in our schools anyway, because we're required according to our creditors. One thing, first and foremost, is the concurrent enrollment. So again, coming from compliance, um, I, I require uh, my schools to be enrolled the day they start 
their vocational program. And that way, no oversight agency could say, well, they weren't concurrently enrolled because they didn't start till day two. Darlene, so when, they, when it comes to that program that you're talking about, like let's say the C4L or something like that, is that, it, does the school enroll them and, and is there a cost associated with it? Or are you just telling the student, go to the site and do it yourself? How does that work? Jen, you ask all the right questions. So this would be an agreement between the school and the, and the adult high school provider. Okay, okay. Yes. So you're so not you saying go find cost. one on your own. You're saying we have you, a, we have a part, you could. You could, but it'd be harder for the school to track. So I yeah. always said partner with an adult high school provider. And plus you can serve the students better by being familiar with their system. Yep. So you would partner with an adult high school provider. You absorb the cost. It cannot be listed anywhere in the tu student's tuition. That's one of the seven areas. So when you list out books or lab fees or tuition, whatever it may be, it cannot be included in there. So no Title IV funds can pay for that. So the entrance exam or the adult high school program. So that's one of the seven areas. They have to be concurrently enrolled and it cannot be included on the tuition breakdown. The other is you have to be able to justify that the skills the students are acquiring can serve the community. In other words, there's a need in the community for that skill set. Well, we typically do that now anyway in our schools through advisory board meetings. Mm -hmm. So that's easy enough to do. Um, another one is we have to... Uh, assess our students' academic and career prep progress. Now, typically we do this in our schools anyway. We assess students if they're not progressing, maybe if they're falling below SAP requirements or they're falling below attendance requirements or, you know, 14 day and last day of attendance. So again, we do it right now. And even though it's not prescriptive, we have to set a standard for ATB students. And let me give you an example. I always recommend doing it during orientation. So again, it goes back to one of the standards that we have to assess their academic and career prep readiness. I think doing it during uh, orientation where you're face-to-face -face with a student and you say, Darlene, this is what you've signed up for. Mm -hmm. Let's look and plan your, your week. You know, what days do you go to work? What days do you plan on studying? What times? You have to get that finite. So a student has a, a schedule to follow so they can be successful. So that's why I say do the first advisement or assessment during orientation. And then I recommend every 30 to 60 days after. 30 is a little administratively heavy. 60 usually works. So then at 60 days, I would meet again with the student and say, uh, Darlene, you're, you're tracking great. You've got a 3.4 GPA. Your attendance is at 85%. Good job. Let's talk about your career uh, skills preparation. Let's see, you've met with career services. You've done some interview um, uh, preparation or skill sets practice. You've done some job search um, practice. Um, you know, there's a you dress for success. Whatever it may be that prepares a student to go out into the field and find a job, we document all of that. Remember, documentation with compliance is everything. So you would document this all on a form. And then after another 60 days, you would sit again with the student. It doesn't take away from you meeting with the student if they're falling below SAP or, SAP or attendance uh, requirements. It's separate from that. So we have to show documentation for those two areas. That's one of the other seven areas. Um, and then a couple of the other ones are, you know, it's just kind of basic stuff. It says a student can enter your program whether they've been in the vocation or not. Why they put it on there, I think they try to align it to uh, 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 WIOA standards, because um, that is really what brought all of this back. But the other the other items, the other pieces of the seven items are very simple and things that we do now. The key areas are being concurrent. 
Having the resources to support these students, maybe if they lack transportation, we do it now. Childcare, we do it now. Um, and then we advise them or assess them periodically. However, the school uh, determines uh, or how often they determine to do that. So that's the school's determination. Okay. And then on average, we do have a question in the chat. Um, what do these, if, if the high school, I'm sorry, if the cosmetology school is going to consume those costs, right, to put each person in this program, on average, how much do those programs cost? So, you know, I hate to say exactly, but it's usually between six and seven hundred dollars. Okay. So if you look six, seven hundred dollars plus it's nine dollars and something cents for the AccuPlacer. They're, sure. you know, two dollars and ninety cents, I think it is per unit. Um, so that's pretty minimal to be able to serve this population. So it is what, a cost. Yeah, what I was going to say, I think you, you bring up a good point. Like, first of all, the enrollment itself is usually 18 to $20,000, right? A, a, around that in the cosmetology industry. But you're also looking at serving a population that a lot of people yes. just say too bad to. And yes. these are, I think that is the bigger part of it. We all know that this is going to be a small part of our population. So yes. most of the people who we meet with will have high school diplomas that come in. Um, it's going to be that easy enrollment kind of, you know, traditional enrollment. But we have a certain group of people that I think a lot of schools and a lot of careers and a lot of people are just, they kind of give up on them. And yes. I know that beauty schools are in the business of changing lives and making sure people do something that they love and they're passionate about. And a lot of our students, they're not traditionally great high school students. Some of the times, you know, they're not lecture style learners or that wasn't the right environment for them. Um, right. So I do think that, can you speak a little bit to that and how you have seen schools introduce helping this population and it making a difference in that way? Well, Jen, I have to go back to what you said. It's serving our communities. Um, and we benefit, of course, from it too. But most importantly, we take, a, a, you know, an adult off uh, out of our community who otherwise may be involved in crime unwanted pregnancies. And I don't like to do it as one broad swath because some students leave high school to tend to a family member. You know, yeah. their families are sick and they have to work to take care of them, but they want to advance their education. Um, now I do have to say in my experience, um, they need encouragement, they need support because they're not used to winning. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, it's very important to have someone at your, someone at your school who is responsible for connecting with that student often. And that should be not only faculty, but maybe somebody in career services or student services to remind them, don't stop, keep going, leave with a high school diploma and a cosmetology diploma or certificate. Yeah. You, you, they've got to be encouraged. Yeah, I, I agree. And quite frankly, even people who have a high school diploma, <laughs> once they get to our career schools, they need encouragement. I mean, again, these are hands on. Yeah, we all do. So yes. that completely makes sense. And it would be good too, if we had, you know, someone in the school that maybe was passionate about being that cheerleader for that person, yes. maybe admissions, but maybe admissions is so busy that it is you know, a registrar or someone in, in career services, you know, another staff member to be in charge of these ATV students to follow up with them. Now, as the school, let's say you partner with uh, one of those high school diploma programs, high school programs like C4L that you mm -hmm. mentioned, does the school have access to like logging in and seeing their progress? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. In fact, it's encouraged. Um, so they will be given access to a dashboard where they can review the progress of all of their students. And you want to be able to do that. So if I'm in school, didn't have a high school diploma, you want to log in. And, you know, the faculty member or career services want to come to me and say, Darlene, I haven't seen you log in your high school in a while. I haven't sure. seen that you've completed a, a test. 
that's what I mean about the encouragement because they're taking two programs at once and they don't feel confident because they failed before. They don't feel confident that they'll succeed this time. So they need that extra encouragement. The neat thing, Jen, is I've seen so many success stories. And you know what, what threw me into such uh, being so passionate about this was when I worked for a school years ago in, in downtown Atlanta, and there was a girl, seven kids. She used to drop them off at school and a babysitter. She used to take a train and then a bus. It took her an hour and a half to get to school, but she never stopped. She never stopped. She was an ATB student and she graduated and it changed her life completely. And I think the impact of seeing that student commit and the outcome is what drew me even closer to this population to say, you can. The thing is, like you said, so many schools don't realize they can serve this population. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah, you can. Um, Melinda just wrote in our chat, we have an ATB student academic, uh, we have an ATB student academic advisor that is our student's cheerleader and our advocate. She's so passionate and understanding our students' stories and struggles. Darlene, I'm right there with you. So I think that's awesome. I do want to, um, Monica had a question because um, a couple of people had mentioned this in the chat. It's possible to receive by, from the state board um, exam to get like your esthetician or your cosmetology license or your nail tech license. Sometimes they might require a high school diploma. Good point. If that's that the case, case you can enroll them as an ATB. So if they're required in some states to have a high school diploma, you can't guarantee that they're going to graduate from their adult high school program. And therefore, you would be burdening them with debt. Got it. And they're not able to be placed in a position that they've trained. Okay. Now, if, if they require a, a high school diploma, mm -hmm. GED or equivalent, like it's uh -huh. kind of that line, then they could. Mm -hmm. But you basically would, could you have a conversation with that student about you're not going to be able to get your license until you do complete this program? Or would you still not enroll them? I wouldn't enroll them. And, you know, we have to make that information available to students through our catalog, um, our student right to know when they enroll, um, if their occupation requires a high school diploma. I would not enroll them because, again, as much as you say it, they might not complete the adult high school and therefore they can't proceed in their position. And that's just the case with different states or counties. Um, it is by state, and so yeah, that different. is for sure something you'd have to check with your state board, especially for everyone yeah. on here, because I know some probably uh, do require that. Someone said, I came in a bit late. Can you elaborate again on the program for high school while in cosmetology school? It's not a GED. Can you say the name of that again? The career <laughs> pathway. What, C4L or oh, Eligible no. Career Pathways Program? Yeah, yeah. Let's oh. just make sure that um, we just quickly sum up what it's called. And then, of course, oh. you find, yeah, then you can talk a little bit specifically about C4L because someone also asked about that. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry. So you want to go? Yeah, okay. yeah, go go through that quick little sentence about what type Absolutely. of to be. <laughs> so that's okay. Prior to 2012, we served ability to benefit students. And that is verbiage through the U.S. Department of Education that says a student doesn't have a high school pro uh, degree, but they want to enroll in uh, one of our programs and have access to Title IV. So prior to 2012, they would take an entrance, an ATB entrance uh, test. They'd be enrolled, have access to Title IV. Then they paused it for two years. And then when it came back, it came back as ability to benefit. So it's still an ability to benefit program, but it's yeah. tied to more uh, the WIO or the workforce piece. Uh, and it's called Eligible Career Pathway Programs. Or so they, will still take, refer to, they will still take like an entrance, ATV entrance exam, Je um, Jesse. Yes. And then they can get enrolled in this additional program. And tell us about C4L, just so everyone can know how to sure. find that. Because a few people are asking about that. Sure. And you know what? It seems so confusing, all of it, but it's so simple. It and is. I'll go to C4L, but ATV is no high school diploma. 
ECPP is they're concurrently enrolled in a high school program. <laughs> That's as simple as it is. Yeah, I mentioned C4L again. I I did business with three um, adult high school providers. And again, there's several that serve our sector. I liked C4L because of their, first of all, their product. I was so impressed with people who write and update their curricula and the delivery. You know, it's interactive. That's the world we live in now. And that's what students like to see is a lot of gamification that, you know, it, it, we want to see them succeed. And so we want them to feel comfortable with the systems. But I also like their dashboard. So what we were talking about is tracking the school, having the ability to log in and track a student's progress in high school. Yeah. Um, it's so easy to follow and they'll also integrate with your system. So if you have Campus View or Diamond SIS or whatever SIS system you have, it will integrate to uh, produce one report. Um, so I like that too. So you could look at attending behavior of a student in their adult high school program and look at their attending behavior in your program because you have to watch both of them. Okay, perfect. And I did put that URL for that school that you just mentioned, C4L Academy. That URL is now in the chat if you guys want to go there. Melinda said that um, they actually use them. So they're an online reputable high school program. Oh, right. I'm quite fond of, and we partner. They're with accredited. Them. Yes, yes, perfect. And, That's awesome. And, and by the and, way, mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm happy to share any of the template policies and procedures that I've created. And it goes to admissions, marketing, financial aid. But part of that is a description of the adult high school provider, because when you have an oversight representative on campus, you want to show them a policy and procedure that you know what you're talking about and that you follow. So it's not that you need approval by anyone for this. It's just no. that if you do have a review, this uh -huh. is something that you need documentation for, but it's not like you have to go to your accreditor. A lot of schools here are accredited no. by NACUS. You don't need to ask NACUS for permission to use this. Now, I would double check with NACUS. Um, okay. I'm not as familiar with NACA. So I would just, I would pose a question just to be safe. Uh, but I don't know of any other creditor that you have to in the department, you don't have to. In fact, um, you know, if a pro, uh, the, the department does a program review, it's actually in their audit guide, the things they'll look for if you serve ATB students. And if I could add this, Jen, you want an identifier in your system. And most SIS systems now have an identifier for ATB. Because you need to track that in NSLDS as an ATB student. Because let's say I enrolled and I finished my high school program in two months. I'm no longer considered an ATB student. I'm a traditional student. Mm -hmm. So I would no longer be tagged as ATB through NSLDS or internally through the necessary procedures as an ATB student. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Jesse says, so they are taking high school online at the same time as this. Yes. You're taking it concurrently with the cosmetology right. course. And she says, and they don't still qualify for FA. No, they do. They do they qualify do. for title four funds, they um, do. which is such a great benefit to schools. And that really is the perfect demographic for, for title four funds. So I think that's awesome. What are some things that we need to be careful about? Is there anything any ways that schools can get in trouble, that maybe that um, stop them from doing this? Is there anything we need to be cautious of? Jen, again, I'm so glad you asked the question. It, You know, it's scary. I can remember years ago, um, there was a cosmetology school. I, I don't know what happened, uh, but they were, they're fearful. They stepped away, something with the department. Interesting, they just entered um that sector again serving those students and it's going great but right you know and with anything with accreditation or compliance if you don't follow the standards um you're you're gonna eventually get in trouble with you know one piece of the triad so mm -hmm. with anything you've got to follow the department, your accreditor standards are internal. And this one is more internal because the department is only prescriptive in those seven areas, but very vague. In other words, the advisement or the assessment of academic progress or career preparation, that's all they say. 
So you have to build something internally to say, okay, this is going to be my standard every, you know, 60 days. So as long as you follow the standards, your own internal and any oversight agency standards, you're okay. I know everybody reads the news. We've heard about a school recently, uh, not a cosmetology school, allegedly doing things that they shouldn't have with ATB students. Um, and, and, you know, and they're paying the price now. And it's alleged. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But, you know, it, it's harmful to us anytime if we don't follow the regulatory standards. Jen, I want to add one thing. Because when we were talking about the students uh, that have to have a high school diploma through a state board or a local municipality to be certified or licensed, I had uh, um, a school group come up with a great idea recently. The CEO said, you know, I spent about $11 as a, a cost per lead. And she said, I think what I'm going to do is instead use that money to pay for the student to get their high school diploma in hopes that they'll enroll with us when they're finished. Mm -hmm. Because it's really less of a cost. Mm -hmm. the, the students would come on campus and take it. So it really cuts her uh, uh, cost per lead in half because these students would just come to her, right. um, not even advertised. You know, we we all have that. Students who come in and want to enroll and we find out they don't have a high school diploma. But I thought, you know, that's a really creative way to think about it because regardless, you've still served your community and regardless, you've still spent the money you know, as a as a cost per lead, but at a reduced amount. So there's a lot of creative ways you could look at this to be able to serve the community. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to people who don't finish, because we know that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, do you have to return? Someone had a question. Do you have to? Do you have to return Title IV funds? No. You don't. Um, but this is the thing you have to be careful of. So a student finishes your program, they don't finish your adult high school program. When an oversight agency is on your campus, you wanna be able to show good outcomes again, yeah. because you wanna to continue to be able to serve the population. And if you have the resources in place and you have good outcomes for adult, for the high school portion and good outcomes for your own portion, you know, there's gonna be no question that you're able to serve the population. Yeah. But yeah. You, you don't have to return any funds. No. So we are really, well, that is also one of the reasons why they have to take that test, right? We want the entrance right. test. We want to make sure that they will be successful in this. Just, I know we want more enrollments, but it's not worth it to enroll 20 people who, who don't graduate. I mean, that's, you're going to look terrible for that. I mean, that's, right. not, that's not the goal of this. The yeah. goal is really for them to complete this. And so yes. we want to, we want to be able, you know, to prove that out. Is there something on the FAFSA application itself where you have to put where you went to high school or where you got your diploma from, um, where they would then need to put this program? How does that work? So I'm not an FA guru. I know enough to be dangerous. So Rhonda, you're on. Maybe you should go in the chat, but go ahead. <laughs> we know on the past, but they have to input their adult high school, but we know it's not a good matching system. Okay. But I don't believe, I haven't heard of anything that identifies them as ATB. But usually students fill that out before. And, you know, it's when they get through the admissions process, they find out that they're not... Um, you know, they have to come in as an ATB student. So perfect. Okay. Yeah. And then when it comes to that entrance test, um, uh -huh. I'm just here in, in the chat. Is this something that your school needs to somehow administer like on a computer or, or how does that work? Is someone over their, their shoulder to make sure they're not cheating? Like, how are we, how are we doing? Yeah. That? <laughs> I let you ask these great questions. I don't. That's so, people do. <laughs> <laughs> we have good people. We have good so, people. So, no, it's actually, all right. So, when Wonderlick was around, we had to hire proctors. If, if people on this call remember, you, you had to incur the cost for an outside proctor. And that was actually written into the U.S. Department of Ed standards. With Accuplacer, it baffles me, but they say specifically to use internal employees. 
Now, personally, I don't like the optics, right? We used to, with ATB, we would have a faculty member work half day as an instructor and half day as a proctor. Not here. It's um, you use somebody internal. So, yes, they would have to be at a, in a room, you know, at a computer taking a test. And, yes, somebody would have to make sure that they're not cheating. But it would be somebody internal. Again, not something I favor. I questioned it with AccuPlacer. But they're insistent. They've spoken to their inside counsel. Um, so it would be somebody internally and not an outside proctor. And they okay. don't allow on online proctoring, by the way, okay. unless it's an employee, unless it's an employee. Okay. So that's also really good to know because mm -hmm. there have been schools in the past. I won't mm -hmm. bring them up, but specifically, I'm sure a lot of you all know that some schools have gotten in trouble for administering some sort of test like this or the high school diploma program and basically feeding people answers. Um, so wow. I know. Mm -hmm. Not good, not good. So we need to make sure that everyone is in compliance here, that people understand, you know, the rules for this. So we could essentially, could they go home and, and study for it and then make plans to yes. come back to the admissions office and do it? Is that what you would, would you do? Yes. In fact, I'm, like I said, Jen, when Wonderlick ATB went away, I was a little worried about AccuPlacer because they have a math component. Right. I'm not even good at math. And some of these yeah. students who dropped out of high school, I can only imagine. Um, but they have great prep materials. And I'm shocked at the pass rate. And they can retake it. And there is no limit. There's only notification to AccuPlace so they, so they can track. I think it's after three fails. But okay. um, yeah. And, and going back to proctoring, they can proctor. In fact, AccuPlacer gives a whole uh, thing of guidelines if the school wants to online proctor using one of their employees. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then someone mentioned that the administrator cannot be uh, financial aid or admissions. So it would actually have to be someone else. Right. So that's that firewall or the separation of duties. And that's with anything. Anybody who awards cannot be the person who draws. And in essence, if you're an admissions rep, if you're approving an enrollment, you're approving awarding a Title IV. So that's exactly correct. Okay, fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. This has all been super helpful. So let's say people want, to, I've already put your email, by the way, I can probably sure. do it. I put it way up there, but I, I put it in the chat for everyone so that they can reach out to you directly. And I'll go ahead and, and redo it so you guys can see the latest message there. Um, but, you know, Darlene, can you tell our community how you can partner with them and work with them to help? Implement yeah. them? Absolutely. So I do it. Um, I work part time right now. I've tried to retire, Jen. And um, I'm actually vice president of compliance for a small group of schools in California. Um, but in my spare time, I work with the school. So um, I usually do training online. So we'll do a Zoom or a Teams call. Um, and there's usually a representative from each vertical. So marketing, admissions. And I'll share with them what I've seen. Works, doesn't work, things to be careful with. Um and we go through the policies and procedures. I've had some schools ask me to come out. Um, in that case, then there would be the expenses of flying out in a small fee um, for me uh, spending time a day or two at the school. Um, but it's really simple. I always say start small. You'll get the hang of it and then start to expand the percentage. And by the way, the department doesn't allow you to go 50% over uh, uh, your OPID. So the total population of an OPID, you can't enroll more than 50%. I say, don't even go close to 50%. Right. <laughs> I don't it, think that that small. would be even common. I, you know, knowing beauty schools, I would say it would probably be a pretty, you know, a small percentage. Um, but nowhere near 50%, but that's also really good to know because depending on where your school is, you know, I know that certain, some areas, I, I was just at a school not long ago and, and they were in a suburb and they were like, I was, I was, I was, I was talking a, a suburb right outside of an inner city area. 
And she was uh-huh. like, I know like 30% of the people in here don't have high school diplomas. She's like, I'm constantly turning mm-hmm. people away. So that is a perfect yes. to introduce yes. like this. So maybe you try it at a couple campuses, make sure you get the hang of it. But just just to be just as a reminder to everyone, you do not need to go through any approvals, but you do yeah. need to document everything for reviews to make sure you're doing everything compliant. Um and then, of course, Darlene, I know that you, you know, you mentioned C4L. I know that they work with a lot of very reputable schools in this market. They do. I have been at lots of conferences, as you know, and I go to CQ and I go to C-SPEN and I go to FAPS and MACS and not just the beauty school conferences. I go to higher ed conferences in general. For right. Sure, I see um, you. Yeah, yeah exa- exactly. And that's where I find other school owners that I'm just like, oh, like, you know, nursing schools and, um, you know, different types of schools out there that just offer all types. They use this program. So yes, I they do. Makes it always makes me feel better when I see smart people using something. So yes, and they're uh, accredited, they're which is important. Yeah. So yes, yeah. perfect. Well, I appreciate you answering all of our questions and coming on. Absolutely. Just, just a reminder, everyone today, um, you will get a recording to this webinar tomorrow. So um, make sure you send it on to your team so that they can be aware of this. And if you guys have more questions, please reach out directly to Darlene. Um, and then what is the website of the AccuPlacer? Just so I can go ahead and, and, and put that. Is it? I hope I found the right one. I think it's, Dot I have it on my computer. Is that right? It's, um, it is, but I think there's a, like a sub Yeah, the ability to URL. Write. I feel like I found yeah. it. But okay. it is co- under College Board. But again, okay. I've got all the training materials, the contact person, Oh, lovely. Anything. Just reach yes. out to Darlene. She can just hook you well, up. I can send it to you if you want. Or yeah, I'm happy anybody reaches out. Any way I can help. I'm Perfect. just so glad uh, that you're interested in serving this community. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a part of our webinar today. If you guys have questions, thank reach you. out to Darlene. Thanks again. Thanks, Don't Jen. Control, you guys. We're getting close to the end of the year. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.